Well, we're already past the first exam and looking at chapter five. We're going to spend two chapters this week and next week talking about costing systems. To understand what they are, I went back to our chapter two lecture and stole out the graphic we used when we were talking about the types of inventory accounts and how the costs flow through the accounts. So I'm going to kind of back up, review that a little bit, and then we'll talk about how that fits with job order costing and chapter six's concept of process costing. If you remember that manufacturers have three inventory accounts, materials, raw materials, work in process, what's happening on the factory floor with those products that are partially done at the moment. They're in process. And then the warehouse that is full of products that are completely finished being made, they're just waiting for their buyer. And this one is the most like the merchandising businesses from your financial accounting course, their inventory account. These two had no parallel in a merchandising business because they weren't making products. They didn't have raw materials and partially done products. They just had finished products that they bought from their supplier. So again, let's look at the flow. You buy raw materials and you stick them in the materials inventory account. So as this period began, there were $14,000 dollars worth of product worth of raw materials sitting in the warehouse they bought another 25,000 over the accounting period 32,500 dollars worth of raw materials were pulled out of the warehouse and put into production they were used in the forming of new products there were already some costs in work and process the materials were added in labor and overhead were also added in and all the costs related to the products that were finished. So we finished a bunch of products and they were moved to the finished goods warehouse and the total cost of making the products that were finished were $88,500. Those products sat in that warehouse until they were sold and there were $90,500 worth of products sold. That's not the price we charged our customers for them, but that's the total cost it cost us to make the ones that were sold. So we pulled our costs out of this account, leaving the balance only 7,000 of unsold but finished products. That 90,500 gets stuck in an account called cost of goods sold, which is gonna show up on the income statement. Remember our last chapter, we talked about the traditional income statement, sales minus cost of goods sold, tells you if you made gross profit. Now this is the cost of goods sold that will be on that statement. Hopefully that's kind of bringing things back up into your memory banks. Where we're gonna spend our time is right here. Looking at the work in process account. In our system, job order costing is a method of tracking the costs that come into and go out of work in process each period. What kinds of companies use job order costing and what is job order costing? It's keeping track of each quote unquote job that we do. If we're a manufacturer, we've been using the example of manufacturing dining room tables. If we get orders from suppliers or from places that we supply, furniture stores and so on, that they need a set of tables, we'll write that up as a job. The art van furniture stores have asked for 10 dining room tables. So we're gonna call that a job. I'll give it a job number and the job is to make 10 tables. So we'll keep track of all the direct materials, all the direct labor, all the overhead that went into making those 10 tables for our van. And all the other customer orders or all the other batches of products that we decide to make, sometimes they don't have a customer. It's just we realize that we're running low on our supply of 
the large dining room tables in Walnut. So we'll put in an order to the production staff and we'll create a job to make more dining room tables and we'll keep track of the costs that way. The opposite of this is process costing. That's chapter six. Process costing, you can think of as the traditional assembly line process where you make the same product over and over and over again. There's no sense in tracking the costs that went into that individual item on the assembly line because the costs that went into that are identical to the same costs that went into every other item on the assembly line. So this is used, job order costing is used when the company makes custom order or unique products. Process costing is used when you make homogeneous products. Process costing makes sense because all those products have all the same costs. Think of it as Kellogg's and the boxes of cereal are going past. All the boxes of cereal have the same ingredients. They all have the same amount of each ingredient. So the cost of making that one box is the same as making any other box on the product, on the production line. But job order costing is more likely to be used by an architect to keep track of the jobs that they're doing for different clients because their services that they're providing to the office building that they're building downtown is different than the apartment complex that has hired them to build or draw the drawings for all the new apartments. Every job takes a different amount of labor, different amount of raw materials. Uh, we could install custom swimming pools Again, each customer's order is going to be very different depending on the materials they chose, what we have to deal with in the landscaping of their lawn to be able to put the swimming pool in, how big a swimming pool they want. You know, just all the options, there's so many of them that each job is going to be very different. So one of the things you're going to need to do in the chapter is be able to identify which companies would use which kind of costing system. So if they told you the story of XYZ company makes um, glass bottles to be used in the beverage industry, they send them on to Coca-Cola and Pepsi and so on to fill them with their soft drinks. The glass bottles are made in an assembly line process and they are all identical. You would say process costing, but then they tell you about someone who does home remodeling. More than likely every home that you're remodeling is going to be different. Everybody wants something different. So that would be a job order costing. So being able to identify which ones use process costing, which ones use job costing is going to be important in your understanding of these two chapters. Now we're going to go and look, open up another Excel spreadsheet, another tab so that we have some clean space to talk about job cost sheets. They'll have a sheet for each job. It'll show the direct materials used on the job, the direct labor, and the overhead. I'll spell that out. And where do you get the idea of how much is being used for direct materials? They come from requisitions. When the factory floor or the workers working on a particular job or home remodel ask for more materials. They make a requisition sheet that says, I need this much material, these many yards of this, this many linear foot of that to be used on job number and they'll name the job. So then someone is keeping track of as it comes out of the raw materials warehouse and gets taken out of 
this material's inventory, where does it go? Well, if $32,500 of materials were used in production, now we need to know specifically how much of that $32,500 went to this job, how much went to this other job, and the way we're going to keep track of that is we're going to look at the job cost sheets for each job. And we'll see the amount of material used on that particular job. There'll be another job cost sheet and the direct materials used for that job. Same thing with labor. When they keep track of their time, fill out their time sheet or swipe their card, it's going to be specified which jobs they're working on. But it's going to call them something slightly different, but there's going to be a labor report that says these employees worked so many hours on that particular job. Maybe the crew was assigned to work on the home remodeling on Miller Road. And then someone, some other crew was assigned to work on a different job. So we'll keep track of which employees worked how many hours on which job and the particular job will be debited for the amount of labor spent on that job. Then overhead, how do you decide how much overhead applies to each job? That can be tricky. They do it by determining a good driver for it. And that's a word you're going to hear a lot in managerial accounting. It just means that someone has figured out that the more of this one thing you do, the more overhead this job uses. Remember, overhead is depreciation, utilities, all these production-related costs. A lot of times, the driver is direct labor. So they assume the more direct labor a job uses, the more overhead the job should be charged or given. But the problem is we don't know what the overhead costs are going to be. If you wait to the end of the year and figure out oh, 2018, how much, you, how many utilities, what was our total indirect materials, what was our total indirect labor, what was our depreciation in our property taxes, and you could come up with this grand total of overhead for the year of 2018. That would be our actual total overhead, and then it'd be great, and then we could figure out some way to give out a piece of that to every job. But the problem is these jobs are probably long since done. They might have been done in early 2018, and now you're just figuring out what their share of the overhead is. That's going to be awfully hard to total up the job, figure out what our costs were to do the job so that we knew how to price it to the customer. That can be difficult. So instead, they use an estimated amount of overhead. and they allocate it based on an estimated number of direct labor hours or direct labor dollars. Sometimes I said to, they do it by the total amount they think they're gonna spend on direct labor over the year. So the formula, actually pretty easy, Estimated overhead divided by estimated direct labor, either hours or dollars, and that gives them overhead rate. So let's take a look at an example in the book, and we'll steal some numbers out of there so I can work through a problem and see how this happens. We're going to go with exercise 531, and let's find the page number for that. Looks like it's 215.
and it tells us at the beginning of the year they had overhead of this much, direct labor hours of this much. And they use normal costing, apply overhead on the basis of direct labor hours. And for the month of March, the direct labor hours were this much. Well, their estimates at the beginning were, so we know their estimated overhead that was given to us in the problem on the very bottom on page 215, $522,900, and their estimated direct labor hours. Going to have to get used to those abbreviations. They're going to show up on a lot of formulas as we go through this $83,000. Remember, our formula just says divide those two. So our overhead rate, we're going to get by taking the 52,000, divide by the 83,000, and I get approximately $6. $6.30 if I expand it out. That's per direct labor hour. There's the rate that we're trying to come up with. What do they do with that rate? Well, every time there's a job, these job cost sheets, and someone says, oh, put six hours of labor on that job, and then come down here and go six times $6.30, and that's how much overhead to put on the job. And now it's easy to determine the overhead once you know the overhead rate. So part of your homework is going to be determining overhead rates, and other parts of it are going to be keeping track of the job cost sheets, where you're slapping in the materials that they tell you that was spent on the job, how much labor was spent on the job, and then applying the overhead based on a rate either that they give you in the problem or that you figured out in an earlier step in the problem. Okay, that brings up a couple other points. What happens once you figure out all these costs? Let's see if we can track a few jobs. We're going to look at exercise 5-37, just a few pages over, exercise 5-37, and we're keeping track of a bunch of different jobs in this exercise. It actually stretches on to page 218, so it's page 217 and 218. And the jobs that they tell us about are jobs 877, 878, surprisingly enough, 879, 879, and the last one is 880. And we are tracking the costs of these jobs as they go through the month. Um, the first cost that we usually deal with is direct materials. So job 877, and I am not making these numbers up, they're given to me in the story problem. Page 218 tells me these dollar amounts that I'm using. And it tells me that direct materials were 14,460, then 6,000. So someone has been really efficient in ke keeping track of the raw materials as they come out of the warehouse, which job they were being used on so that they could put them under the right job heading. A couple things here to make sure that those don't look like numbers that we need to add into our story problem. And then we have to keep track of the direct labor. And again, they give us the direct labor dollar amount. 14,800, 8,500. And you notice how widely these vary. Some jobs are labor intensive. Some aren't as labor intensive. Some are just smaller jobs in general. You might have the swimming pool installations and you've got the really fancy house with a huge swimming pool with all the complicated apparatus that go with it and then you've got a much smaller deal where it's a smaller in-ground pool without all the big features. Some are labor intensive and some are just labor intensive because they're just a bigger job. So the third component we're going to need in here is overhead and according to our story problem 
they apply overhead at the rate of 80% of the direct labor cost. So that's pretty easy. It's not a $6 per hour. One, we don't know how many hours they used. All we know is the dollar amount. So this company just says, yeah, whatever labor is, do about 80% of that is overhead. So we're gonna go up here, find the labor cost, times it by 80%, and that's gonna be our cost here. And let's see what happens when we stretch it across if our formula replicates. So we'll look at our formula. Yep, this takes the direct labor and times it by 80% and so on all the way across. Now we have the total of the production costs that have happened on these jobs. I'm just gonna total each column and find out what the total cost of each job is. And then we're gonna determine the status of the jobs. And according to the story problem, job 877 was completed. So I'm just gonna write the word completed down here. Remind us this job's done. But the rest of these jobs are not done. There's still more work to do next period. So this will be the beginning balance as we roll into November. And in November, they might have more materials, more labor, more overhead that are just going to pile on to this cost. So the grand total is going to be 21300 plus a bunch more cost. And hopefully in November, maybe that job will get completed. So again, something that I just want to emphasize it may be obvious, it may be completely confusing. So on the risk that it might be confusing, I'm going to go ahead and explain it. And if it's been obvious and you're bored, I'm sorry. I'd rather have you bored and already grasp it than to have you lost. So we're going to look at the work in process account. And according to the story problem, we had no jobs in process when October began. All these jobs were started in October. So one of the first things that happened is direct materials were put into production. They were put into four different jobs, but the grand total of all the direct materials was 25760 That was put into work and process. Then direct labor was done. The time tickets were totaled. They figured out how many direct labor hours and dollars were put on each job. And then we figured out overhead. And overhead should work out to 80% of this number. We can either do it by timesing by 80%, or we can just go up and get this number. Sorry. Did not mean to drag that guy down there. The work in process in total got materials, labor, and overhead for a large grand total. Palisize that a little bit and shade it so we realize it's a total and not another number to be totaled. But remember, things don't stay in work and process. Once they're finished, the ones that are finished get pulled out and taken over to a separate account. Called finished goods. Our $41,100 is going to be put in finished goods. So that journal entry would be made to move $41,100 out of work and process and over to finished goods. That's for that job. So the balance that would be left in work and process. 74,000 minus the job that did get transferred out leaves us 33,600. And that should be the combined total of these three jobs. So let's just take a second and make sure it is. It should represent the total of the three jobs that are still in process. And it is. So that's our final balance. Ending balance in work in process at the end of the month. Finished goods. These sit here in finished goods until they're sold. And it says that uh, this job was sold. 877 was sold to the client and billed at a certain price. 
So cost of goods sold, and again, I'm abbreviating, is going to be debited for this job. So it's going to leave finished goods and go over to cost of goods sold. So finished goods is going to end with nothing. The balance in there will be nothing because all the jobs have left finished goods. There's nothing hanging out in the warehouse. It's already transferred to the client. The last thing we're going to figure out is Tab 877, what did we charge the client? Did we make a profit on this job? Well, the problem says that we charged them the cost plus an additional, an additional 50%. So that means we're going to charge them $41,100 plus 50% of... Forty-one thousand one hundred. That's forty-one thousand one hundred plus, and half of forty-one thousand is twenty thousand five hundred and fifty. So the total we're going to charge our client is sixty-one thousand six hundred and fifty. So that's the price. To determine the profit, we're going to compare that to what it cost us. And what did it cost us to make it? $41,100. It was the amount we moved around there. So the profit we made is the difference between these two numbers. And we made just over $20,000 in profit. A lot of stuff coming together here. We've been used to seeing work in process, but now we're breaking work in process up into its component parts. In financial accounting, you used to have accounts receivable, and then you had a separate account for each customer where you kept track of what the customer bought from you, any payments they made, what their current balance was. We call that a subsidiary ledger that backed up the whole accounts receivable. Probably had the exact same thing for accounts payable. You have the same idea, of, well, you may not have seen it in your textbook, you'll have the same idea for inventory. Because a store is going to have a ton of different inventory items and they have to keep track of each one. How much of it do I have on hand? What have I purchased? What did I pay for that purchase when I purchased it? So there's a subsidiary ledger for inventory that backs up the big inventory account. There's a subsidiary ledger that backs up the equipment so I can keep track of each item in the equipment, how much I'm depreciating it by, how what its useful life is. There's just so much detail that a lot of times the numbers and the accounts we see listed on the balance sheet have a subsidiary ledger to back them up and work in process is no different. Oh, that's process costing, or sorry, that's job costing, process costings next week in chapter six. Let me know how you're doing. Let me know if you have any questions as you try to apply job order costing or what they're trying to ask in the questions in the book. Sometimes you read those questions, you think, I'm not sure what they're trying to drive at. And then once that gets cleared up, you can solve the problem because you understood the concept. You just couldn't quite translate what they were trying to ask. That's when you reach out to me and say, I'm stuck. I need something. Good luck. Hope to hear from you soon.